afternoon, everybody. So let's start at the beginning. I was born in Port Elizabeth, studied at Rhodes, and once I got my BA, like all good BA students should, I went off to save the world. Um, I, being proudly South African, wanted to work on the continent that I was born on, and so off I went, naively into the world. Ten years later, a little wiser, I hope, a little better traveled, seen a bit of Europe, seen a bit of the UK, seen quite a lot of Africa. And these are some of the places that shocked me the most. Anyone know where that is? Any guesses? Joburg? It's actually Angola. Any guesses where that is? Joburg again? It's actually France. That one? Grahamstown? Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. What about that one? London. What about that one? South Africa, Cape Town, Tvintuk. <laughs> and so these are some of the things that, that shocked me. And look, I was in for quite a few surprises working in Africa. But, but the next one was less shock and more dawning realization that contrary to what I'd been taught, the most important and the greatest resource that Africa had was not its wildlife or its white sanded tourist beaches. It's not our minerals. What I learned was that the most unrecognized and the under, most underutilized resource in Africa is its people, particularly its women. And even though the narrative on Africa is changing and the, the tales of the next great investment frontier still do focus on our gold, our oil, our gas, our diamonds, our people are still undervalued. And this means we're excluded from the formation and management of our aid programs, from our financial systems, and even the governance of our own, uh, monitoring of governance in our own countries. Um, so what I want to talk about next then is that we need to recognize that there's a lot of potential. And so you would recognize that in this room, we're much more privileged than the average group of Africans or South Africans. Yet when last were you asked what needed to be done in terms of the infrastructure in your neighborhood? When last were you asked to rate your postal service? When last did you have the opportunity to nominate a Nobel Prize laureate? When last did any one of the numerous NGOs constantly asking you for money asked you how you would like it spent? When last did they even account for spend to you? So at the end of the day, that means that there's something we need to do. We need to listen. It sounds really obvious, it sounds really simple, but that's where we need to go. If we um, focus on why we need to listen, we need to look at what's happened to those who have listened. And the people who have listened have achieved remarkable success, far greater than anybody ever expected. And so, by taking a step back, listening to the people involved, there's something for all of us to learn. But who was it that taught me to listen? Well, there are two people, and their names are Anastasia and Esther. And I met them while we were living in, in Kenya in 2008 and 9. We lived in a place called Ngong. It was a township just outside of Nairobi, about 25, 30 kilometers from the center of town. We lived in a pretty big house. It had six bedrooms, and ironically, this was a really small house by Ngong standards. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there weren't or there aren't poor people that live in shacks in Ngong. How the people across the road from us, for instance, were four families living in three shacks. However, our neighbor to the right was a politician, couldn't get a photo of his house, who lived in an 18-bedroom house. And so unfortunately, we were living in a society that was vastly unjust. Um, and those that were stuck in poverty really did have very few options to escape from its grip. So a friend said that she was going to come and visit Kenya, and I decided that this was an opportunity to at least attempt to do something to make a difference in our community. She agreed. And so, a couple days after she arrived, we're sitting around the lunch table with two of the women that I knew best from the community, Enta Anastasia and Esther. And Anastasia and Esther were both mothers. They both didn't have jobs. 
They never describe themselves as unemployed. Nobody in Kenya really does, because no matter whether you have a job or not, you're always trying to sell something, start a business, do any piecemeal work to keep you and your family alive, and Esther Anastasia were no different. During the lunch, the researcher in me came out and it turned into a bit of a qualitative focus group, and we discovered something important, that the greatest barrier to them starting a business or getting a job was, any guesses? It wasn't a lack of ideas, it wasn't a lack of resources, it wasn't a lack of access to funding, and even though they lived in tin shacks, it wasn't about infrastructure. It was about the availability of trustworthy and cheap childcare. Both women did not have families in Ngong, that's the traditional Kenyan daycare center, and so anything that they got involved in had to take this into account above all other things. We explained to them that we had some money, 500 rand each, which is about 5,000 shillings, to invest in a business, and instantly they identified a gap in the market and explained the opportunities for us to take advantage of this. But I need to take a step back first and tell you something else about them. Uh, Kenya first. That Kenyans drink a massive amount of tea, more than any British person I've ever met. <laughs> um, and this tea has to be made in a very specific way. No kettles are involved. Big pot, half milk, half water, then the tea bags go in, then we boil it, then you add a hell of a lot of sugar, and you've got the perfect cup of Kenyan tea. Now, despite these cultural characteristics, the only place to get tea on the go is a place called Nairobi Java House, our mug and bean equivalent. The cost per one cup of tea on the go, 40% of the monthly minimum wage in that country. Obviously, tea on the go was not really an option for your average Kenyan. What Esther and Anastasia were suggesting is that we start a tea place to sell proper Kenyan tea to Kenyans. They suggested that we do so with one permanent stand outside of Esther's home. She lived halfway up a really long hill, and Gong Hills is what Ngong's better known as. Um, there were also a lot of construction sites around there, and so we figured also thirsty construction workers. The other site was to be a mobile site at taxi and bus ranks so that we could get the early morning and early evening rush hour commuters. And so by the end of that first meeting, we had our idea, we even had the name, the tea stop was born. A week later, three of us were on the bus to Car and Circle, which is the closest place that the commuters gathered, um, and we were going to give the mobile stand its very first go. In the meantime, the preceding week, quite a lot had happened. We'd made some logos, we'd got some stickers printed, we'd bought the bags and trays to have the mobile stands, we'd bought all the uh, uh, ingredients to make about a thousand cups of tea, we bought the equipment to make that tea in, and we bought some trunks to store all the equipment safely in. We also started the permanent stand outside of Esther's house, and so Esther ran that while we went to Karen, and very importantly, also looked after Anastasia's children while we were gone. We only stayed for 30 minutes that first day, we had a few logistical issues that we needed to work out that didn't really make staying any longer worth the time. However, in those 30 minutes, Anastasia sold 35 cups of tea at 40 shillings each, two shiny coins from each of the com uh, commuters that we turned into 1,400 shillings for her in 30 minutes. Now, bearing in mind that the monthly minimum wage is 5,500 shillings, that's a mind-blowing amount of money, even if you have to divide it in two. I just want to reiterate that, 5,500 shillings, so 550 rand for the month, and she made 140 in half an hour. If we do the maths there, that means she would have to do seven half an hour shifts in a week to make what all, everybody else in the country was making in a month. So, we divided the day into two two-hour shifts. Each woman did one, one in the morning, one in the evening. This meant they were never too far from their children, they had free close, safe childcare in each other, and they could continue with the small vegetable businesses that they were doing from home anyway. In the next three months, their income increased to 1,200 rand a month each, 12,000 shillings, twice the minimum monthly wage from one two-hour shift a day. It made a massive difference, and these women were able to start changing the way their lives were. A little while later, they continued doing so for the next two years before they moved out of Ngong, because they now could. 
in that 70 Rand extra a month grew every month for two years. That wasn't just from the tea stock though. That was from having the time and the resources to be able to invest in other things now that the very basic needs were taken care of. The reason this worked was because we treated the people involved as experts of their own context. They were the locals, they were the ones that had the knowledge. We, we got to grips with what the beneficiaries' actual circumstances were, and as such, we're able to then start to change those. One example is not really enough, though, so let's move across the continent to West Africa and look at Ghana. A company called Blue Skies Ghana. And the, when the, star, uh, the management listened to the staff and, in, and it tapped into their local knowledge and insight, they not only saved the company, diversified the product line, created a new market, but also reached uh, revenue levels that had never been seen before with the company. So let's start a bit at the beginning though. It's 2007, they produced canned fruit and juice for the European market. The recession hits and their market starts to wither. Several failed attempts from management to try and turn the company around and they call the staff together to tell them that unfortunately we are going to have to close the company. The 700 or so machine processors and staff packers asked for three weeks to be able to turn it around. Management did, uh, so far down the line we may as well give it a go. So the next day they came back and they suggested that instead of focusing on the expensive production process of creating canned fruit and juices for export, that they should change their focus and sell local, fresh fruit locally. Management thought this was a terrible idea that it would never work. We don't have a local distribution network. We don't have any trucks. We don't have any truck drivers. And so the staff went away without saying anything to management and each took home two boxes of fruit that day. They did that for a week. And at the end of the week, accumulated all the cash together and handed it over to an astonished management who not only had more cash in hand than they had in months, but also had a whole new business model and market to follow. This sort of success lies available for everyone who listens. Um, however, the consequences for failing to listen are beyond just a business closing, beyond just projects not being successful. They can cost lives. And this has been seen all across Africa with the fight against malaria. Almost the second that the nets are handed over, they turn into fishing nets or animal traps. And so the very well-intended distribution and fundraising just has no impact really on infection rates at all. As David Yamenga in Kenya said, dying from malaria is much quicker and much less painful than dying from hunger. If we look at the use of mosquito nets for the intended purposes, it does vary from country to country. Africa is a very big place, not one country, as we know often people make the mistake, especially overseas. But the, range, the, the use of them ranges from 26% to 51%, and the 51% is in one country. Most of the countries sit around 30%. And so, by not taking the time to understand the local context, by not taking the time to understand the local circumstances, millions, millions of dollars in time and resources are wasted. This means lives are wasted, and this because nobody listened. There's a Swahili proverb that says, listening is the most difficult skill to learn and the most important one to have. I'd go further and say that without it, you cannot be successful or impactful in Africa. Now, I need to be clear here that when I'm talking about listening, I mean listening in the broadest possible sense, not biological process of hearing sound. We're talking about to pay attention, to heed. That means understanding your local context that you're going to be working in. And that is a specific context. Even from province to province in our country, those contexts are different and you need to understand them if you want to have an impact. That means living locally, local, local, not expat local. So not in one of the one or two expat suburbs with all the other foreigners. You need to be living with the locals. You need to be buying your food where the majority of people buy their food. You need to be using public transport at least occasionally. You need to be socializing with your neighbors. You need to be consulting the local news sources. And you need to be learning at least the basics of the local language or languages. In addition to this, you need to make sure that you take the time to involve your beneficiaries on every single level. Really talk to them. Really understand the circumstances that they're facing and that the barriers to these. If you do those two simple things, the scope for progress and development is absolutely ginormous, but not as big as the scope for the personal development and growth that you'll go through.